Act one of Le Popillon was beautiful and terrible. They could see why those dancers were considered some of the best in the world. The way they moved, both in perfect synchronicity and as individuals themselves, was incredible. Like separate valves, keeping beat in a single heart. And yet, on my way out of the theater, I tossed my ticket for Act 2 into a nearby garbage can. The experience had been breathtaking. But in more ways than one. I haven't seen Le Papillon done by another ballet company, but I'm not sure it's supposed to be performed as... violently as it was by Madame Taglioni's dancers. It was going okay until the fairies teased Hamza. The antagonist, the fairy Hamza, the young woman in all black, had a scene at the ballet's start in which she is teased for her lack of beauty by the other fairies. Understandably, that makes Hamza angry. Really angry. As the fairies spin and dance around her, twirling and leaping with grace, she claws at them. Rooted in the center of the circle as they tease her, she pulls at their skin until bits of it came away. Long scratches formed on the fairy's exposed arms and legs, yet none of them so much as winced. She got a hold of some of them by the hair, and the momentum of their continued dance tore chunks of hair and scalp out, which Hamza spitefully hurled out of the center of the circle and into the crowd. I guess that's why no one sat in the front three rows. Again, I looked for any signs of protest from the audience members around me, but found none. Instead, their eyes shone in the darkened theater with sheer delight. Act one continued like this. If there was a fight scene, it was real. If there was an injury, it was real. And yet the dancers kept going. Not just kept going, but didn't let on that they were feeling any pain at all. And then there was Emma. She had worn a small cape at the start until Falfala's transformation into a butterfly allowed her to reveal her wings. And when she did, the audience oohed and awed, and she beamed back at them. The hesitance I had seen, or at least thought I had seen, had disappeared in the glow of the limelight. Her cream ballet slippers turned red as she spun on the blood and gore that had collected on the stage's wooden floor, and when she leapt, small sprays of it kicked up and onto her dress. The faint smell of sweat and iron drifted to my nostrils. Act one ended with a sequence of atrocities that made my hands start to sweat and made the girl sitting next to me squeal with delight. The young man in the impressive golden crown, Prince Dalma, quite literally pinned a dancer playing one of the butterflies to a prop tree. I was thankful to see that this girl's wings, dull and plain as they were in comparison to Emma's, were at least fake, kept on by a harness. I didn't have to wince when he drove a stake through one and into the surface behind it, trapping her. I did wince, however, when he did the same to each of her hands. Though pursued by villains throughout Act One, Farfalla is finally rescued when Hamza is captured by the very fairies she had abused at the start. Bruised and bloodied, the fairies forced Hamza into a too small net her skin poking through the mesh, her face disfigured. Once inside, well, they, they tore her apart. They were still clawing and kicking when the music faded. There was a few moments before the curtain dropped when you could hear it. The dull thump of hands and feet beating flesh and then, and then thankfully the curtain dropped. The crowd went wild, whistling and clapping harder than ever. When it rose again, the dancers were there, standing in a line, all smiles. I only knew most of them were wearing white because I had seen them before the show began, blood still dripping down the foreheads of those missing hair, and I could, I could see tears shining on the cheeks of the girl who now had large, gaping red holes on either side of her hands. Even Hamza stood, the print of the net on her skin along with bruises and knots that had already begun to bloom purple, and yet... Yet they all looked extremely pleased. Except Emma. I thought I might be projecting my own horror, inferring with my ability to interpret her facial expression, but, but that right then, her face amongst the others, so clearly under duress in comparison to their displays of masochistic glee, her, 
Her mouth formed an unconvincing grin, and her eyebrows constricted at the top, as though she were resisting the urge to cry out. Not that we could have heard her if she did. The crowd went on and on, and it wasn't long before they were all standing. I stayed in my seat for a moment, but I got up after the girl next to me gave me a reproachful look. The sound escalated as Madame Taglioni limped back onto the stage, back to the microphone that had been replaced in the center. Thank you, she said above the noise, then motioned for the crowd to take their seats. After they had obliged, she continued, There's so much beauty and joy in this performance. Even after fifty years, it takes my breath away. There were a few scattered claps and whistles. As always, Act Two will take place tomorrow night. Here, at the Masonelli Theater, at the same time. Then she turned slightly and gazed at Emma. Her smile widened and Emma tried to match it, though it looked more worried than joyful. Come to see Farfalla's flight, she said. Then she turned back to the audience. But for now, have a good night. And then the lights came up. The girl next to me let out a long sigh of satisfaction. Wow, that was incredible, right? I knew it would be, but still, this was just so... I got up before she could finish. I didn't want to hear anymore. I felt sick. I pushed past the strange, rich patrons of the show, nearly tripping on more than one long gown and one pet iguana on a leash. While the rest of the audience members lingered in the theater and partook in the refreshments, I made the long climb back up the staircase. It was jarring to go for that much excess and richness to suddenly, suddenly being back in the abandoned shack in the mystery corner of Augustus. I walked back out the doorway and onto the street outside. I started walking straight ahead, determined to get back to something I recognized, where I could call a cab without the phantom smell of blood still haunting my nostrils. We'll see you back tomorrow night, sir. I looked back. The kid, when he'd first taken my ticket, still stood behind the glass outside. He smiled placidly at me, and I felt a sudden surge of anger towards him for being a part of whatever happened downstairs for not warning me before I took part. I didn't answer him, I just kept walking. And eventually I made it back to one of the busier streets, where people were still out and about, even at this hour of night. I wonder if any of them knew the kind of sick and twisted thing that was happening in their own city. As I waited for my cab, I took the other ticket out of my pocket, the one that said, Night 2. I stared at it for a moment, then I... Then I threw it away, in the bin next to an ice cream parlor. First, at first it made me feel lighter, like getting rid of the ticket had also rid me of the heinous images I had seen that night, but on the ride home I felt a tinge of regret. It would have been an incredible story. The biggest I'd ever reported on yet. If I had been able to see Madame Taglioni's famous La Papillon in its entirety, and weirdly I felt bad about leaving Emma, I went home. Strangely enough, I slept. It was a long, deep sleep. Like, the only dream I had been meant to have that night was that nightmare I experienced in that theater. The next morning, I went into the office early. Even if I hadn't seen the entire thing, I was still planning on writing about Le Papillon. And I wanted to get it all down on paper before I lost some of the details. Plus, I always work best before my other co-workers get in and distract me. Heather had given me a key to the place a long while ago. I used it fairly often. I unlocked the door and made my way to my desk, like usual. There was something already on it. An envelope, opening side up. I slowly picked it up and peered at its contents, although I already had a feeling about what was inside. A single ticket. Maroon. Gold foil. Come see what's hot at Madame Taglioni's ballet. Celebrating 50 years of Le Papillon. Masonelli Hall. Admit one. And on the back. 
night too. But that wasn't the strangest part. The strangest part was what had been written on the other side of the envelope. Help her. And delicately taped to the paper. A small, dead, beautiful blue butterfly. Hey there, kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I want to tell you thank you so much for listening to tonight's story. I also want to remind you that it is cold. <laughs> I guess you probably already know that. But it is cold out there, everybody, and if you guys are looking for a way to warm up, you can always check out my wife's tea shop. That's etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea. She sells different kinds of teas based on Dungeons and & Dragons and creepypastas and airbender and everything else. So if you want to have a great way to warm up this holiday season, then hey. There you go. I also want to give a very big thank you shout out to all of you guys out there on Patreon. If you guys want to check out patreon.com slash Mr. Creepypasta, you're able to support the show, uh, support me, support my cats, support, you know, uh, being being cool folks out there like people like these. Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Mr. Thud, Ken Lando Higuchi, Chumpinski, Bobby Carmen, Nico Kyle, Tristan Pelton, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, Raven Hart, 1-800-Nightmare, King Hades F-13, Unknown Nobody, Joshua McMeekin, Michael Scarborough, Kazen, this is my real name, no shit, Jason V.B. Wilson, Infernal One, Little Wolf Gaming, Jimbo the Hutt, Caspian, Jordan Niels, Hades Nephew, Jordan Wayne Deckard, Bradley Lipe, Anne Charon, Acid System, Mike Bollock, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Brian Arse, Cryptic Nightmares, Brianna Wright, Someone You Love, S-Man, Kiri the Sloth, Thomas Burgett, Liam Newman, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Nina Smith, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. Thank you guys so much for your support on Patreon, like I really can't thank you enough. Uh, and everybody who's down there in the description, thank you guys so much as well. And everybody who's not on either of those tiers, who just have a dollar on Patreon, I, I really, I can't thank you guys, like, for making these these past 10 years incredible this this entire time i've ever spent on youtube on podcasting everything amazing and all of you who are at home listening thank you guys so much for listening i hope you all have a wonderful happy holidays and sweet dreams <laughs>